Hello and welcome. Um, I look forward to spending the next two hours with everyone that's joined us and hopefully be able to share a little bit of information and knowledge. Uh, again, we welcome questions at the end. Uh, like Lisa said, you can type those questions in. Also, if you notice at the bottom of the screen down there is uh, my website and um, I'm more than welcome if you don't have an opportunity to get your question answered or you want to submit a question via my website, I'm happy to give you a uh, Answer, answer those questions and there's also handouts of this lecture and other lectures uh, on that website if you're interested in that. So with that we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, tonight we'll be talking about materials that he says cements. Those materials are indirect restorative materials. In other words things that we're going to be restoring to structure with. Okay so um, I'm a member of Catapult Group and in addition to providing education like these webinars tonight we also evaluate products uh, in our offices and a lot of those products I'll be talking about tonight. Okay, so um, I have no conflicts of interest, but I do wanna thank the sponsors that Lisa mentioned already, GC America, Bisco, and Doxa. And I'd like to briefly talk about a few of the products of these companies, uh, these webinars and programs that we do wouldn't be possible without our sponsors. And uh, they work very diligently to provide the kind of materials and, and support that we need to provide good dentistry for our patients. Uh, I'll start with GC uh, and some of the products that, that I really like, and a couple of them are new. The first two are really new. Well, they're not new products. They're just more, more uh, they've been developed and improved upon. Uh, the Fuji Sim Evolve is, is a relatively new resin modified glass ionomer with, with some new uh, improved benefits. One of which is they, when, I, when we get into uh, technique at the end and how we actually cement and bond, We'll talk about what I call a flash cure. That is when you have a what resin component and you cement, if you wanna get that cement to a kind of a gel state that makes it real easy to clean off, it's not as easy to do with resin modified glass isomers as it is as true resin cements, but this Evolve has a, a, the capability of doing what we call a flash cure, which I'll explain in a little bit and some other improved uh, properties of the cement. So resin modified glass isomers, they release fluoride, uh, really good cement. A lot of my colleagues still like them a lot, and we'll we'll talk about those when we get into cements, as well as self-adhesive resin cements. And GSIM one is the is uh, GC's newest self-adhesive resin cement. And again, they've incorporated some new technology in this product as well. It's it's been it was uh, released fairly recently. One of the things that also comes with it um, enhancing primer and adhesive enhancing primer. In other words. If you're most of the time, and, and, and we're gonna go into this in a lot of detail later on in the, in the uh, program, talking about how we cement, the difference between cementing and bonding. And we prefer to cement if we can, because it's less technique sensitive and it's just easier. But sometimes we might run into some non-retentive situations and, and a self adhesive resin cement may not provide enough retention. So GCM, GCM1 is, is uh, compatible with their adhesive uh, primer enhancing primer that allows you to paint this on the tooth, go ahead and cement without light curing and uh, before you put the cement in the crown and crown on the tooth and they all cure together and it just enhances the, the bond of the tooth. And like I said, we'll be discussing that in a little bit more detail. And then a product that I really like a lot is Genial Bulk Injectable, the GBI. The reason I like this so much is I've, I'm incorporating flowable composites a lot more into my practice. I really like flowable composites and I like bulk fill. I like the ability to be able to bulk fill. So not only do we use this for uh, restoratives, we're also using it for uh, you know crown buildups and things like that. Uh, so it's a, it's a great product, simple and easy to use and uh, can be very convenient in a lot of different clinical situations. Uh, Bisco, I, when I think of Bisco, I think of adhesives. Uh, I've been using Bisco adhesives for many, many years, starting with their, their uh, Albon uh, 2 and Albon 3, which were great products for many years. I'm now using their universal adhesive called Albon Universal. Uh, since the title is Materials Adhesive and Cements, we're going to be discussing adhesives pretty thoroughly. Um, we'll be talking a lot about universal adhesives. If you're not using them, I hope I can convince some people tonight the benefits of universal adhesives and um, why I think they're so, uh, you know, such a great uh, addition to my practice and hopefully they will be yours. If you're already using them, you probably already know why universal adhesives can be so, so beneficial. We'll go, we'll be going into that in a little bit more detail. 
Theracim is uh, Bisco's self-adhesive resin cement. I like self-adhesive resin cements, especially like Theracim because it releases calcium and fluoride ions. Uh, it has a basic pH, so it's um, you know acid resistant. Uh, it forms, it helps form hydroxyapatite, and it's it's very kind to the tooth, and it gives good adhesion naturally to both tooth structure and in the restoration. And we'll also be talking about uh, how uh, you know normally when most of our zirconia restorations, we like to just cement them, where we don't treat the tooth or treat the restoration. I call that conventional cementation. Sometimes, however, it might be necessary to bond zirconia. And bonding zirconia is different from bonding glass ceramics. And we're gonna go into this in a lot more detail, but Z Prime Plus is a ceramic primer and it's Visco ceramic primer that allows you to bond zirconia to two structure. And we'll be talking about that. And our last sponsor for tonight is Doxa. Doxa is a Swedish company that uh, developed, uh, was one of the early developers in bioactive products and their first cement, Cerebral Crown and Bridge, uh, which came out several years ago, was I thought you know a, a real quite a great advancement in in what we were doing. Uh, it did have to be triturated in a capsule, uh, and it has no resin component, but it has calcium and fluoride in it. It's uh, it it has bioactive properties. It adheres to tooth structure uh, the, at the tooth restoration interface, forming hydroxyapatite, and uh, has a lot of a lot of benefits in in that regard. Uh, a really good cement, simple and easy to use. Uh, it doesn't have a light cure component, but it sets in a gel state and is very easy uh, to use and to clean off. Uh, the Samra Restore, a couple of their newer products, the Samra Restore and Samra Protect. The Samra Restore is a resin-free self-curing bioceramic uh, restorative material. It's, uh, it's kind of like a glass ionomer uh, and can be used in situations that glass ionomer is pretty popular in. Uh, like pediatric and geriatric dentistry. Uh, it does release uh, fluoride and calcium. And uh, because of the ion release, it makes it really beneficial. And it's, it may not be as quite as aesthetic as some of your uh, resin uh, restoratives, but it certainly could be beneficial in certain clinical situations. And the Samra Protect is one of their newer products. Uh, and it's a, uh, a pulp capping uh, for both direct and indirect pulp cappings. It's a, you know, um, it, it, it basically bonds to tooth and it will release calcium, forming calcium bridges, and it can be used under restorations, uh, both on direct and indirect pulp capping. It has a very uh, significant calcium ion release, uh, which helps form hydroxyapatite and dental bridges. So these are some of the products we'll be mentioned in some of these more as we go into the, the lecture. Just wanted to kind of start off by thanking these sponsors and letting you know what some of the some of their better products are that I that I like and use in my practice. So tonight, our topics of discussion are going to be the factors that affect material selection, the restorative materials that are available. I'm going to go through materials. I'm actually going to go through materials. I'm in, I mentioned a couple of indirect restorative materials that that you know probably aren't used that much anymore, and I, and I'll give you the reasons why. But just to be complete, we'll we'll live, give you a list from the weakest to the strongest. Uh, we'll discuss when we use these materials and we'll talk about the different classifications of adhesives, uh, the class four, five, six, seven, eight. We'll go through the classifications. We'll talk about conventional cementation versus adhesive red. This is, I think, an important distinction here because when I say conventional cementation, I simply mean one, one thing, and that is you do nothing to the tooth and you do nothing to the tagular surface of the restoration. You don't have to do anything but rinse and dry the restoration. You don't have to do anything except rinse and dry the tooth. You can put an antimicrobial, you can put a desensitizer or something like that, but you're not putting anything on there to enhance bond to the tooth, and you're not putting on anything on the restoration to enhance bonding to the restoration. That to me is conventional cementation, and it doesn't matter if it's a, a resin cement or a resin free cement, and as long as you don't treat the tooth or the restoration, we'll talk about that. As opposed to adhesive resin cementation, we'll talk about that. There are times when you have to increase retention to the tooth, and we'll discuss what those, what those times are and how we do it and how we bond the different materials, whether it's a glass ceramic or, or zirconia, we treat those, those materials differently. And we'll be going into that into some detail, explaining how we, how we do that. And then we'll show the adhesive bonding and cementation protocols because when you adhesively bond, there are pro it's very important 
that you follow strict protocols. And we'll discuss those, pro those protocols in detail and we'll go through all of that. So the factors that have the, just briefly discuss the factors that affect when we're going to decide, okay, what material are you going to use? I'm basically going to kind of try to simplify. In my mind, it went from ultra simple when I got out of dental school to a few years ago being a lot more complicated because there were just so many materials being developed to back to being a little bit more simple again. And I'm, I'm going to kind of explain what I'm talking about because I think it's almost gotten back to where I only need really two or three restorative materials today, uh, indirect restorative materials. And, and I'll kind of explain why, but I'm still going to go through the whole list of what they are and what's available. And then we'll talk about what I use and why. But the factors that I still look at when I'm, when I'm choosing material are certainly, if it's an anterior restoration, the set of goals for the patient is always going to play a big factor. In other words, most people today expect restorations on anterior teeth to be aesthetic because it, it's, it's, it's so much easier for us to achieve this now in dentistry that patients have come to expect it. So we have to, we have to address that when we're doing anterior restorations. But also we have to address the functional requirements of the res restoration. Even in anterior teeth, there are certain functional requirements and we have to look at that and we'll talk about that as we go along. But certainly posterior restorations that are gonna be under heavier loads, uh, having a have strong enough material and using a strong enough material. And sometimes function is, is a little bit more important in posterior teeth and aesthetics is maybe a little more important than the anterior teeth. But when you have a material that can kind of achieve both, then you have a really good material. And we'll talk about that as well. Uh, color of the tooth or substructure. This is especially in anterior restorations. We know that the more translucent a material, the more aesthetic it's going to be. But if the more translucent the material is, the more it's gonna allow underlying color to show through. If you have good underlying color, that's a good thing. We actually want that because it'll give depth of color to the restoration and it'll give it a more natural look. An example of that would be a very thin porcelain veneer over a nice tooth color. You can get really good aesthetic results by putting a thin translucent veneer over a nice colored tooth, but you cannot use a translucent material over a dark tooth or a, 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 a metal post and core or a titanium implant above that or a really dark endodontically treated tooth or something like that because you, you don't have the ability to block out that dark color with a translucent material. So what material you choose, and we'll give, give some examples of that in just a minute, will it affect our material choice if we're, if we're trying to block a really dark tooth? Our next uh, factor that we look at is where's the tooth? We, we touched on this already. Anterior teeth, I'm looking more aesthetics. Posterior teeth, I'm looking more, uh, I want a, a, the, a, the stronger materials. Uh, is it a single unit or bridge? Some materials uh, might be really good for a single unit, but they may not be strong enough for a bridge. Are there certain types of materials that we're using now? Uh, it may be a, a, a layered material or it may be a monolithic material. Certain zirconias, I think, are strong, but I, strong enough, but they have certain, even zirconia, as strong as it is, the solid zirconia has certain requirements of, of thickness and uh, more thick than metal needs to be. So there are some situations clinically that, and we'll talk about that as we go along too, uh, the material of choice for, say, if you're doing a, a posterior bridge. And are we going to cement or bond? If you're going to cement, there's certain materials that you can you can cement universally, but there's certain materials that if you that may require bonding. And if if an, uh, an example would be a porcelain veneer, you may want to cement a porcelain veneer, but you're not going to get have, have very good success. So depending on what what your clinical situation is, it might be. It might be whether you're going to cement or bond. It might be the type of restoration, where the restoration is, how much retention you have. All these things are factors when you're selecting the material. And lastly, I just briefly want to mention your previous experience. If you're having success and you're happy and your patients are happy and you're and you don't think you're paying too much or any of these situations like that, I I'm not telling you anything that you hear tonight. You need to change. If there's some things that you hear that you say, well, you know, that might be worth looking into or might be worth trying, that's fine. But I'm not trying to tell anybody that they should change anything they're doing if they're happy and they're getting good results. So 
you know, Frank Spear sums it up pretty well. And I kind of like the way he says this. See, Frank is so great about simplifying things and making it so easy to understand. He says that all tea should be restored with the most conservative restoration that satisfies the patient's aesthetic and functional requirements. So that's really what are the aesthetic and functional goals and what material will satisfy that as conservatively as possible. If we look at this like a, a triangle, we're looking at the three, ed, three legs of the triangle being aesthetics, function, and conservation of tooth. An example of that would be a porcelain veneer. As we mentioned earlier, a porcelain veneer can be aesthetic and it can be very functional when it's bonded to the tooth. But if you try to put a porcelain veneer over a really dark tooth then and, and be very conservative in a minimal preparation, it might not be aesthetic. So you might have to have something that allows for more thickness to block out a darker tooth. Conversely, a, a full crown can be very aesthetic and it can be very functional. But if you have a nice colored tooth, there's no reason to drill healthy tooth away to get an aesthetic and functional result because you could do that with a more conservative veneer. So this is, a, this is kind of what we're talking about. We always wanna be as conservative as possible. We always wanna choose the restoration that allows us to, to, to reduce the least amount of healthy tooth as long as the final restoration is both aesthetic and functional. And hopefully we'll be able to you know, illustrate that as we go along tonight. So an ideal restorative material, just briefly, we'll go through that, what we like. We want it to be aesthetic, which we've already talked about. That means the ability to mimic natural tooth. Uh, characteristics like uh, fluorescence, opalescence, translucency. These are the things that we're looking for in which laboratories are really good about doing and, and, and really able to mimic uh, natural tooth with some beautiful restorations. Uh, we want it to be strong, be able to withstand occlusal loads. We'd like it to be vital compatible. We'd like it to be color stable. We'd like it to be kind to posing detention, not easily abraded, low solubility in the presence of oral fluids, ease of fabrication. This is a biggie right now. And I'm gonna talk about ease of fabrication because what we have with some materials, not only the materials have gotten better, but they've gotten easier to fabricate. The reason I think this is important for us, the dentist, is with ease of fabrication has come a reduce in price. So it's not as expensive to make these restorations now. And some of them are really, really good. And we'll talk about this some more as we go along. And we'll, we'll touch on this and why I, I have really become a big fan of zirconia because zirconia can be milled and it doesn't require as much uh, bench time and as much uh, skill from a, from a trained ceramist to fabricate a restoration. So ease of fabrication, the ability to fabricate easily, uh, and it, what, that would separate, uh, an example of that would be, say, a feldspathic porcelain veneer. A feldspathic porcelain layer with a powder liquid buildup technique is not easy to fabricate. It's very time consuming and, it's, and it requires a great deal of skill to be able to make one and, and, and have a great aesthetic result. So therefore they are gonna be a lot more expensive. And so these are all factors that you gotta weigh when you're restoring, when you're cho choosing your restorative material. We also like predictability of results because I think that's a big, big factor. All of us as restorative dentists, when we're placing a restoration, we would like to know that we're gonna have a good, a restoration for a, for a good amount of time and that we're gonna have value because that restoration is gonna have a, a, a long lifespan. And we also wanna know that it's gonna seat easily, it's gonna be easy to fit without a lot of occlusal adjustments. So all of these, these things are important in a restorative material. And then lastly, we like versatility. We like to be able to, we like a material that allows us to be versatile, to be able to fabricate different types of restorations. And we'll give some examples of that as what I'm talking about when we go along as well. So what are material options? Well, basically there, everything can be divided into two categories when it comes to indirect restored materials. It could be either a monolithic restoration, that means it's one material, it's uniform in structure throughout, or it can be a layered restoration. That means you're gonna have some type of coping or framework, and it's gonna be layered with some type of ceramic. The original or the first uh, layered restoration was the PFM. And everybody you know, that's old, older like me, when, when I was in dental school, that was it. Our, we had two choices. It was full gold crown or gold in layer on lace, and then a PFM restorations. They're still around, uh, they're kind of dying out. We don't see their use as much anymore. I think there are a lot of reasons. Fabrication is harder, it's more consuming. If you're using uh, gold or a high noble metal, they're a lot more expensive. So there's, there are some factors that are affecting 
layered restorations. Primarily, I still use them, not nearly as much as we used to, and but mostly it's not a uh, layered metal. We're using uh, porcelain fused to zirconia. Most of these are layered restorations, and there are a few clinical situations where we still use these, and, I'll, and I'm going to go through what those are. But most of the restorations we do today, the high percentage of them are monolithic, and we'll talk about you know, what, what materials we're using for those monolithic restorations. So when we talk about monolithic, it could be a veneer. Here you see an example of veneer, and here's a full crown. Both of these are, uh, this one is very thin, very conservative, the other is thicker, and uh, but it's still a full crown. I mean, it's still a monolithic material because it's the same uniform and structure throughout. And then you can have a full crown, like a zirconia crown or a lithium silicate crown, for uh, you know, on a full crown on a molar, like you see in the bottom of the screen. Uh, this the reason we know this is a lithium silicate crown and not zirconia because you can see the intaglio surface there has that frosty look. It's because Lithium silicate is a glass ceramic. It can be etched. It can be etched with hydrofluoric acid to, to increase bond strengths. Now, because this etched, uh, the ability to etch it, you're going to see that frosty look. Zirconia cannot be etched. It's acid resistant. It, it is a solid crystalline structure, so it has no glass matrix and it. it can't be etched. When we get into adhesively bonding zirconia, this becomes really important to understand, and we'll talk more about that. It also doesn't have that frosty look. So you can always tell a zirconia crown from an Emacs crown that's been etched. So this is an example of a layered restoration. It looks about the same thickness as the restoration on the left over here, but it has this thin little core material right here. That's your, your zirconia core coping. And then the other thickness is the veneering ceramic that goes around it. So they're about the same. These two crowns, the left and the right, are about the same thickness. And you'd say, well, why would you go to the trouble to do a layered restoration when you could just do a monolithic restoration. Well, the example that we use when I talked about earlier, I still use these, or if you had a really dark tooth anteriorly and you were trying to block that out, if I do a full crown and I do it in a translucent material, even if it's thicker, it still may allow, allow underlying tooth to show through if it's translucent. If I make that monolithic restoration more opaque to block it out, it won't be as aesthetic. But if I make an opaque layer, if I have an opaque uh, core and then I layer it with a more translucent ceramic, I get the best of both worlds. I have the ability to block out a darker tooth and I still can have a more aesthetic uh, translucent restoration because of, of the layering ceramic. And so that's why we use these. Sometimes we're gonna use a layered restoration versus monolithic restoration. And this is an example on the bottom of the crown. So on the left side, you have a monolithic crown on the right side, the porcelain fused to gold, you have the old layered kind that we that you really don't see much anymore. Some dentists still use them, and I'm perfectly fine. If you like them and you're happy, you don't need to change. But I, I honestly believe that you can get uh, monolithic crowns like uh, lithium silicate zirconia a lot less expensive now, at least in my, from what I've come across with my laboratory, they are. So here's your metal core, and there's your veneering ceramic. So this is an example of what I'm talking about. If I back up really quick, why would I use this type of restoration with the core and the veneering ceramic? Well, what if you have a tooth like this? You see this dark tooth, central sizer number eight. So what happened in this case, patient came in with a really dark tooth, but look at the nice color of the rest of his teeth. He had some acid erosion on the lingual surface. So we're going to do uh, glass restorations on the other teeth, except for number eight, we're going to do a layered zirconia crown on that tooth in order to block out the dark tooth, but still be aesthetic enough to match the restorations on the other teeth. And that's what we did. These are lithium to silicate wraparound veneers on every tooth except number eight. And this is a porcelain fused to zirconia crown on tooth number eight. But you can see we got a pretty good match, still in being able to use a very aesthetic of translucent material on all the other restorations because the tooth color was nice. So this is an example of where we might want to use a layered zirconia crown instead of a, a, a thicker, more opacious restoration. So let's discuss all the monolithic materials that are available today. And I'm going to go from the weakest to the strongest. And I'll tell you the ones that I think are really probably, you know, the ones that we're going to use the most in today's dentistry. So powder liquid ceramics, we call them belt spathics. They were the first porcelain veneers that were done 
Uh, we didn't have the pressing technique. We didn't have materials like Empress and things like that. So the first porcelain veneers were done in powder liquid ceramics. Uh, <clears throat> they were harder to do because there weren't is uh, there were more there's more demand for restorations and there were talented ceramists to do them. It took a lot of skill to be able to to build these restorations up. They weren't very strong. The material's not strong, but when bonded to a tooth structure, especially to a a, a lot of enamel on the tooth. So if you had a thin restoration bond to enamel, they could be very strong. I don't see much use of them for today unless you're willing to pay a lot of money to a highly skilled ceramist. And then there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. Now, this is interesting. This, I put this in here, but to be, I just found out Ivaclar has now taken uh, Empress off the market. And I believe Microstar has taken Authentic as well. I love this material. I love Lucite reinforced glass. It was stronger than feldspathic. It could be pressed, then cut back and layered. So the fabrication technique was a little bit easier. It didn't require as much skill as say uh, a powder liquid technique where you're building it up on a platinum foil matrix or a refractory die. But it, you know, there's the newer materials and I think manufacturers are just saying, I, and I haven't found out the exact reason why, but uh, they're no longer, you can no longer get Empress or Authentic. So this is a category that we're, we're not really recommending anymore, even though I really love Empress restorations um, and, it, and continue to do them even with the advent of the lithium silicate, which we'll talk about in a minute. I, I include this category right here, uh, the milled uh, resin nanoceramic, uh, simply because if you are milling in your office, if you're, if you're using a laboratory exclusively, I don't really see much use for this material but it's not a true ceramic. It's a resin base infiltrated with ceramics that give it strength, but it's very simple and easy to mill and it doesn't have to be fired. So if you're milling something in your office, you would need to fire this in an oven. These materials, and they make beautiful restorations. They're very aesthetic and they're pretty strong, 200 megapascals. Um, and GC has Sarasmart and Shofu has Ceramage and, uh, you know, they can be done pretty simple and easy in your office. So if you are milling in your office, if you have a, um, you know, the, if you're doing that chair side or, or in, in your office, it might be a material that might be worth looking into. So the big categories are the, the next three that I'm, that I'm going to discuss. And that's really the ones that are, I think, making up the bulk of our restored materials today. And that's lithium to silicate. Uh, the, it can be milled or pressed. In other words, the ingots can be, be create you know uh, in a molten state and be forced into a uh, burnt out wax pattern, must a lot like the lost uh, wax technique uh, that we used for fabricating gold restorations, or it can be milled in a solid block uh, with a milling machine, both in office and in laboratory. So it's versatile, it's strong. It can be as much as up to, uh, uh, a lot of people are saying now as much as 500 megapascals of strength when it's bonded to the tooth. So this is a strong material. It's very versatile. It's very aesthetic. Uh, the first materials in this category were Avaclar's Emax CAD, which is the uh, milled version, and Emax Press, which is the pressable version. Uh, the CAD was the 360, and the press was the 400. It was a little bit stronger, but again, these materials are really strong when they're bonded to the tooth. Uh, GC America has come out with Lisi Press, which is a beautiful lithium silicate. And there are other materials out there in this category. Avacar actually had a patent for several years when they introduced their Emax system. And um, no one else was manufacturing these restorations for quite a while. And now um, there are other, other materials like Lisi Press, which is, has a smaller particle size and is very aesthetic, a very, very beautiful material. Um, and, you know, you, you know, you just sometimes have to request at your laboratory, which material you want, depending on what, what your laboratory is using. And then Seltra Duo is kind of a, it's an interesting material because if you're milling in your office, you can both, you can mill this and not fire it in an oven. And it's much like this category before the, re, the, the nano ceramics, uh, and it's gonna be about 200 megapascals or it can be fired, and that's why the name is Duo. It can be actually fired and increase the strength to about 400 megapascals. So it's, it can be, it has a couple, it, it's a little bit versatile too, because it can be used two different ways, whether it's fired or isn't fired. The next category is newer, but 
it's weaker. And so that's why if I'm if I'm listing these materials in order of strength, then the, the uh, translucent zirconius would be next in line. And this is an interesting product because I think what happened with, with uh, zirconia is it was very strong and it was kind of, you know, competing, so to speak, with lithium silicate. Lithium silicate was a lot more aesthetic, but zirconia was just much stronger. Zirconia was anywhere around a thousand megapascals, up to 1200 megapascals. So it was much stronger, almost indestructible in, in some cases, very strong, but was mostly for posterior restorations because it didn't have the aesthetics of the glass ceramics. So what manufacturers determine is if you, I, I want to simple, I don't want to make this too complicated. So let me just tell you in an ultra simple way of saying this. Yttria is used to stabilize. Yttria is a, a is, is a stabilizer. It stabilizes zirconia at room temperature. And the more yttria that's added, the more translucent zirconia becomes. So by adding more yttria, manufacturers are able to make zirconia more translucent and more aesthetic, but it also weakened the material. So that's why you see the megapascal strength down to 500 to 700 versus 1,000 to 1,200 in that category because the, uh, the amount of strength. So the first one, so if you look at mole or mole percent or Y, sometimes they'll say three Y, four Y, five Y, that's for the yttria content or mole percent. You'll see these numbers like MOL sometimes. All that means is it's the amount of translucency. So three Y or three mole would be the strongest zirconia. Four mole would be the next strongest but not as translucent. And then five mole would be the most translucent or the most aesthetic. So for Katana, they have, you know, different uh, translucencies and they have the, the uh, multi-layer, which is their base translucent one. Then they have the super translucent multi-layer and the ultra translucent most. Ultra translucent will be like five mole. So I'm just giving you an example. I put Katana on there because I think it is a beautiful zirconia. We're doing a lot of anterior crowns in zirconia now because I can just cement them and they're in there. Uh, you can bond them as well. And I'll show you some examples of zirconia in just a minute and what we're talking about. But uh, I just I really like uh, the uh, katana uh, zirconia. And I like the fact that, you, you know, these restorations are being milled and they can be made aesthetic and they're really competing aesthetically now with um, your lithium silicates. But uh, Nivaclar came out uh, a couple of years ago with an interesting product too called Zircad Prime. And basically Zircad Prime is developed in such a way that it has the strength of a three wire, three mole, but it has the aesthetics of a five mole. So uh, make something worth looking into. Just I'm just trying to give everyone that's attending tonight an, exam an, an idea of what's out there. I'm not trying to educate you individually on every type of material because it's just too comprehensive to do that. It would be a lecture. Uh, we could do a whole lecture just on zirconia or just on lithium silicate and all that. What I'm trying to do is just give a brief overview of what's available so you know what's out there. And if you see it or hear about it, you have some kind of idea, but you can also look into it or, or talk to your laboratory. Uh, laboratories are very knowledgeable about materials and what they use and why, but don't just take the word for it. Ask them and, and ask them what they're using and why and, and, and why they recommend it or why they like it so much because they get a lot of feedback from the doctors that they're fabricating restorations for. And then the last category is the high strength. This was actually the first zirconias were the high strength. And they were the up to 1200 megapascals. And Glidewell came out with Bruxer solid zirconia uh, that was, you know, one of the first out. And uh, it was basically, if they, as, as Glidewell marketed it, is a, you know, you could hit it with a hammer and not break it. So very, very strong, uh, not quite as aesthetic, but for posterior restorations. The other thing I liked about zirconia is uh, they could be strong at thinner. Uh, you know, dimensions than say uh, lithium to silicate. So for example, you can, I wouldn't want to have a, a lithium to silicate crown one millimeter of occlusal thickness, but I feel pretty comfortable having a zirconia crown at one millimeter of occlusal thickness. So for areas like second molars, where you don't have a lot of occlusal clearance, uh, zirconia could be very, very beneficial. And not only because they're thinner, but they're stronger and there's less tooth 
to reduce axial reductions less because you don't need as much thickness of material or you don't have to, to allow for as much thickness of material. So those are basically start to finish. Uh, oh, and one last thing again, for because there could be some dentists that are, you know, that are they're listening in tonight that do mill in their office. We now have the ability with some new products like Bruxer Now and Cerex Zirconia uh, that you can, they, they, you do have the ability to mill zirconia in your office, which up until recently, you did not. If you were going to do zirconia, it had to be milled in the laboratory. Now they can be milled in the office. So if you know that, great already. If you don't know it, it might, and you're milling in your office and would like to look into milling zirconia, you have the opportunity to do that. So what do we, where do we use monolithic materials clinically? Where would I recommend it? Well, if you are going to do feldspathic, it's basically small design cases, mineral prep veneers. I can't really think of a use that I would want to use. It's just not strong enough to use anywhere else. Lithium to silicate. Remember we talked about, when we talked about um, uh, factors, I mean, the, the, uh, what we're looking for in a restorative material, versatility was one of them. Lithium to silicate is literally one of the most versatile materials. And the reason for that is you can use them in thin veneers, anterior three inner bridges, inlays, onlays, posterior crowns with acceptable occlusal clearance of at least a millimeter and a half. They can be used for implant abutments, implant crowns. I mean, there's, there's, they're very, very versatile. Solid zirconia, the three mole I'm using basically on my molars now. Uh, second molars with minimal clearance, heavy bruxers, posterior crowns and bridges. I use, I, I'm doing uh, multi-span bridges with zirconia if I have thick connector sites. I have had a bridge, solid zirconia bridge break in a connector site. It's happened to me, uh, so it can happen. So you really need, I'm looking somewhere around four milliliters, uh, you know, square. So 16 square millimeters of, of connector thickness. I mean, you might get away three by three or three by four, but you know, I, I really don't want to go much less than that. Two millimeters, two to three millimeters in a connector is just not enough for solid zirconia. That's where you're 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 probably going to be better off with metal. But I like zirconia uh, for for posterior crowns and you know with with less occlusal uh, clearance. Now, as far as the four mole and five mole. Translucent zirconia, we're using these for anterior restorations. I, I see no need for posterior. Um, you just don't need the aesthetics past the second premolar. So any molars, I'm gonna use regular traditional solid zirconia, the three mole or three Y. But for anterior restorations through the second premolar, I would use uh, either four or five mole. If I'm doing anterior teeth, six through 11, I'm probably using five mole zirconia because we can get some really, really aesthetic restorations that rival uh, lithium to silicate. So that rival glass ceramics. My reasoning, and I'll get into this in just a minute, I'm going to show you, I've done a case of zirconia veneers, and they're okay. They're still in the mouth. I just, I like bonding glass better. And when we get into bonding, we'll talk about this, the non-retentive situations of bonding. My preference is, I think bond strengths are a little higher when you're bonding glass versus bonding zirconia. Although we can get acceptable bond strengths with zirconia, and we'll talk about that. I'll go into that in a little bit more detail. So uh, the advantages of uh, lithium silicate as a monolithic material, it's strong. This is what I'm just talking about, it's versatility. It can be pressed or milled, so it is versatile, like we just said. Uh, it can be used for a lot of different types of restorations. It can be milled very and pressed very thin. You can see how thin these veneers are, which allows us to be minimal in our preparation. Ease of fabrication, whether you're pressing or milling, it's, they're easy to fabricate. They can be bonded or they can be cemented posteriorly on a crown if thickness is adequate. Although I don't do, I've, I've gotten away from uh, lithium silicate crowns. I just, zirconia is stronger. So my, my posterior crowns now are pretty much all zirconia. That doesn't mean if you're doing Emax crowns and you're bonded in, that's fine. My problem with bonding Emax in posteriorly is on a crown is that if you ever have to take it off, it's just a nightmare to take them off. So my preference is if I'm going to have to take a crown or some other dentist is, is going to have to take one of my crowns off in the future, I want it to be cemented because the only thing I'll cement bond anymore posteriorly is a non-retentive situation. And we'll talk about that and, we'll, and how we do it. So I'm not doing much Emacs. I'm doing mostly zirconia so I can cement all my posterior restorations unless it's a, a first or second premolar and it's for aesthetics. But I might do it. But even then, I'm getting really nice aesthetic results with zirconia. 
So I've gotten kind of gotten away from that. And I'm even, if I have full crowns anteriorly, say, let me give you an example. Say you have a patient that comes in and they have old PFM crowns that were done on six through 11. And they want to, they want, they've got dark margins or dark lines at the gum line and they want something more aesthetic. And I'm taking old PFM crowns off. I'm probably going to do those in five mole zirconia because I can cement those crowns. I get a nice retentive prep. I could cement them. I don't have to bond them. I don't have to easily bond and I can get some really nice aesthetic results. So it's just something to think about. It's what I'm doing, but I love lithium to silicate for all these reasons that we're, we're talking about here. Um, so what about zirconia? It's strong. If we're talking about solid zirconia, three mole now, zirconia is less occlusive clearance. As we said, it can be used with feather edge margins according to manufacturers. I like a, a light chamfer. I don't like feather edge, even with zirconia. I like a light chamfer, but I don't need a heavy chamfer. So we're, we have less tooth reduction that way. They're more aesthetic than metal and they function well under heavy occlusal loads. Can be cemented, bonded for increased retention. So but my big fan, uh, reason I'm a big fan of zirconia is our ability to cement. They're very easy to fabricate, which makes them less expensive. And as far as layered uh, materials, uh, basically all I'm doing now layered is in this category here uh, where we're, we're layering uh, porcelain fused zirconia. But these are the original materials that were, were layered. Lithium silicate was first uh, introduced to be layered before it was ever a monolithic material. Then we had alumina, then we had zirconia, and we've always had metal, but these are the different ones. But primarily for me now, I'm using uh, layered zirconia, uh, not, not the uh, uh, you know, original, the more, the, the newer layered zirconias I think are really, uh, can, you can get a very aesthetic restoration with them. So the characteristics of layered materials, they require more tooth reduction, their ability to mask dark teeth, you know, it, so you can, you, this is where I'm really using them. So yes, because you have a core and you have a layering ceramic, you might have to reduce more tooth, but we have the ability to mask out dark teeth. They can be used for posterior and long span bridges. So uh, anteriorly, if I did a three unit bridge, I could do a three unit bridge anterior in, in lithium silicate or zirconia, but I'm doing almost everything now, all my bridges in anteriorly, if it's three units, I'm doing it in translucent zirconia. If it's more than three units, I'm doing it in layered zirconia, anteriorly. I want to maximize aesthetics. If I don't think uh, translucent zirconia is strong enough, then that's where I'd go to layered zirconia for the strength and for the aesthetics. Uh, can be cemented conventionally, which again, I, I'm stressing that. We're going to get to the cement part of the lecture in a little bit, and we're going to be talking about cementation, conventional cementation versus adhesive bonding. And when I can, clinically, I'd always prefer to cement. So any material that allows me to cement conventionally, if my preparation is retentive enough, I'd always prefer to do that. So uh, the characteristics of layered uh, core materials, they, again, they require more tooth reduction for the core and the ceramic layering it, but they have the ability to mask dark teeth aesthetically. And that's a big plus for me anteriorly. Like that case we showed with that dark tooth, that central incisor number eight, that was so dark, we could use a layered core, uh, a, a, a zirconia, a porcelain fused zirconia restoration that allows us to block out that dark tooth aesthetically. Uh, they can be used for posterior and long span bridges, and they can be submitted conventionally. So this is a big advantage, I think, for in the, it's probably, these are the clinical situations. I rarely use layered zirconia anymore, except in these clinical situations where I'm going to talk about right now. Tooth color is dark. We saw that just a minute ago. Anterior crowns over a metal post and core, anterior crowns over titanium. You might have a case like I had, a patient showed up, they already had the abutment placed. I didn't place above it. I, I didn't, they came to me. I don't know how they ended up in my office, but they had a titanium abutment on tooth number 11. And so you've got a canine with titanium, and I'm not going to make them go back, have that taken out and have a more expensive zirconia abutment put in. So we just didn't, to be honest with you, the surgeons I work with, they've had some problems with zirconia abutments, even with tie bases. So they've had some failures. So they like titanium abutments. So if they could do, if you can do a titanium abutment and restore it aesthetically with a layered zirconia crown, you not only have less expensive abutment and the patient appreciates that, but you can get a pretty nice aesthetic result. Just something to think about. And then long span and multiponic bridges uh, anteriorly. 
Long span bridges posterior, it's always going to be solid zirconia or porcelain fused at metal. Anteriorly, if you got multi ponics, say you had six through 11 with two ponics, I would probably do that in layered zirconia, but I might do it in anterior. If I thought the connector sites were thick enough, I might do that in translucent zirconia. Again, it just gives you options. Don't eliminate porcelain fused zirconia because there's times where it might give you options, even if it's not something we're going to be using real frequently. Okay, so let's just look at a couple of quick cases. This is a lithium. Just this, I just want to illustrate real quickly the versatility of lithium silicate. Now, this is this is an older case. Now, we didn't have translucent zirconia when I did this case, which could change it. But you're going to have two veneers here. We're going to have a three-unit bridge. This is a cantilever bridge, which I don't like cantilever bridges. You know that are single abutted. So I'm gonna do a three unit bridge here. This is already a three unit bridge on the other side. And then we're gonna have a onlay veneer, a, a full crown. It's an old PFM crown with recurrent decay. And we have interproximal decay on teeth number three, four, and 13. So we're gonna do what we call onlay veneers and we're gonna preserve the lingual cusps. So we've got onlay veneers, we've got a full crown, we've got bridges and we've got two porcelain veneers. So we've got four different types of restorations and it's all done in Emacs. So this is lithium to silicate. So here's the before and after. So here's our two veneers. Here's our two three unit bridges. Here's our three onlay veneers with the lingual cusps. Now I might do this and I definitely would do the crown in zirconia. Now I would not do the crown today in lithium to silicate. It just shows you it can be done. So I might do all of this in zirconia and do the porcelain veneers and say lithium to silicate. Again, there's a lot of options, but I just want to point out if you are if you're looking for a very versatile material, our, our translucent zirconias and our lithium to silicates have become highly versatile because they're both strong and aesthetic. And that's really what we're kind of looking for. And in, in a lot of our, especially when you're talking about anterior restorations. So zirconia. So here's what we're doing today. So here's the three unit bridge. I could do this in layered zirconia, but instead, because I feel like we have good connector site thickness and we have enough retention, we have enough strength, I'm just gonna do this in translucent zirconia. So this is a three, and these are all retentive preparations. So this is all cemented zirconia, but this is, this is, uh, this is translucent zirconia that can be characterized, stained and glazed, cut back and layered, however the ceramist wants to do it to maximize aesthetics, but we can cement this. In the, in the old days, or a few years ago, we would have done this all in Emacs and I would have bonded everything in. So it becomes a little bit more clinically demanding from the protocol standpoint when you're bonding in versus cementing in. Because we have enough aesthetics with zirconia now, we can do these in, in zirconia. And this is the veneer case we did. I did it just to, to see my, the laboratory wanted to, uh, I was working with, wanted to do a case of zirconia uh, veneers. And so we did this case. Um, it's okay. It wasn't, uh, it was early on and they didn't have the Katana five mold that we have today, which I think would be even prettier than this. The patient was happy to me. I, I don't love the case, but just to show you, they're still in. So, you know, these are fairly non retentive preparations. So that means you can bond zirconia, but it's not, it's not my choice. I still like glass ceramics anteriorly. And layered zirconia, when do we use it? I, I don't know how you guys are doing these young patients with the uh, congenitally missing lateral incisors, but we see that a lot in our practice. I work with an orthodontist and they get through with orthodontic treatment at around 15. They've got congenitally missing laterals. They've got spaces up there. They don't want to wear flippers. They don't want to wear an appliance. They're looking for something and they're certainly not old enough for implants yet. So we've been doing these layered zirconia uh, wing bridges where we do the, um, and now with the more translucent zirconia, we can do it as a one piece. What we were doing is they were layering the facial with a more aesthetic ceramic. But basically this is a two uh, wing bridges, but here are the wings you can see. Uh, you can do it unilateral. You can do just one wing off the canine. Some people do it off the central. If I'm gonna do a single wing, I'm gonna do it off the canine or two wings. We do two wings primarily in these young patients because we don't want any mesial drift or distal drift of roots. Our orthodontist likes us to stabilize the teeth. So if they are going to have an implant in the future, uh, you're not going to have any tooth movement. Uh, 
with a cantilever uh, wing. So that's why we're using the two wings in young people. And older patients, I'm fine either way, two wings or a single wing. But this is zirconia and we're bonded. This is non-retentive. This is where you really need to bond zirconia. So when we get into adhesives and cements and we're talking about how we bond zirconia, we go through the protocol in a little while. We're going to talk about how we bond these teeth in and how, how, how important it is to understand uh, zirconia, uh, you know, the adhesive principles because it isn't like glass. It's not like bonding glass ceramic. You could use glass. There's some people that do these wing bridges and lithium silicate. I like the extra strength of zirconia. And I actually like my wings to be solid zirconia, the more the, the stronger zirconia. That's why we like to come back on the facial with something a little bit more aesthetic. But I want the maximum strength in the wings and in the connector sites. So that's what we're what we're looking to achieve right here. So those are the wings, that's the ponic, and those are the connector sites. I want a little bit more thickness, a little bit more strength there. Here she is. So you can get a pretty nice result. Aesthetically, they look pretty good. They match her teeth and they blend right in. Oh, uh, and then another thing we're doing with layered zirconia is in cases like this where where there's a a, a large defect and you know you just can't, you don't want to fill that up with porcelain right there. So we're going to do a bridge here, a double butted, do a bridge. And we're going to go ahead and do some pink porcelain in addition to the ceramic material. So it's, you know, we're going to do layered zirconia bridge anteriorly uh, with some added pink porcelain to it. So this is the temporary uh, GC and Shofu both have really nice uh, pink composites. Uh, I think this is GC's pink composite we used right here, just to give the laboratory an idea. This is in the provisional, just to fill that in. And then even if the color shade doesn't match ideally, two main things it does. You see the white at the proper heights when they smile, so you don't have teeth that are going up higher. And the other thing too is it fills the defect in and it supports the lip. So just something to think about here. You see this sometimes in implant cases. We've done pink porcelain in implant cases where you know, there was a lot of trauma and a lot of uh, recession, both tissue and bone, I mean, gum tissue and bone recession there. So just, just something to think about too is uh, a technique that can be utilized that can be really beneficial. And then the last thing I'll talk about materials just real briefly, another big advancement that we've seen uh, is the materials that, that last longer. So this patient comes in to us, this is how we saw her the first time and she's got a long, like a seven unit bridge and three of the abutments are, are failed, are, are non-restorable. So she's not gonna just lose the bridge, she's gonna lose all the abutments too. So we refer to our periodontist for an implant consultation and she's gonna be in provisionals for months, for months. So what we did, and there's different ways to do this, we took, just took an impression, took that off, prepped the teeth that we're gonna be able to to be maintained. The abutments, there were a couple of abutments left, uh, this premolar here and maybe one other tooth. And then we take an impression of that, send it to the laboratory, and then the laboratory will fabricate us a provisional out of a material called PFFM. I mean, I'm sorry, P, uh, PMM. Okay, so it's a, it's a kind of a, a long, it's an acrylic material that lasts much longer than your traditional or your regular uh, tippery materials will last. So uh, we can go ahead and put this material in there. And um, this is how, so this is what she had. These are the abutments that we prepped and we take the impression and then they'll reinforce this material. So this temporary bridge is actually reinforced uh, with fiber or with a metal mesh or something to make it stronger. And then it's polished, highly polished in the laboratory and this can be in there for, so we go ahead and seat this bridge and this can be in there for, for several, several months and it can hold up well. So this uh, is just something to look into. Uh, I know we're doing, there's some new things, there's new materials that are coming out. They're getting better, better all the time. And even another thing to consider are those resin, uh, those resin uh, modified ceramics, uh, like the, the resin nano ceramics, you might just charge the laboratory expense to your patient, but those are gonna be strong materials that are gonna be highly aesthetic and they could hold up as a long-term provisional as well. Something that could be milled. And then when she had the implants, this is another example uh, where we uh, used pink, after the implants, there was some more recession there. And I think we used some pink porcelain in this case as well uh, in fabricating it. 
Okay, so that's materials. Let's move on to the bonding agents and cements. Uh, and we'll start out by talking about adhesive bonding and then we'll talk about cements. Uh, when we talk about adhesive bonding, we, we're gonna talk about etching our different etching modes. In other words, how we're gonna bond to the tooth, how do we adhesively bond to the tooth? So there's two, there's two modes of etch when we bond to the tooth. There's a total etch, it's often referred to as etch and rinse, and that's where you put etch on the, the reason it's total etch is you're etching the entire uh, preparation, whether there's enamel or dentin, or it's all enamel or some enamel or some dentin, you're etching both enamel and dentin. That's where the term total etch comes from. Self etch is a technique where you're etching, where you have primarily dentin and you're not using a phosphoric acid gel. You're using acidic primers to etch the dentin. And we'll talk about that. And then the other technique is called selective etch. Selective etch is a combination. It's kind of a hybrid where you put the etch just on enamel because studies have shown you're gonna get higher bond strengths to enamel if you use phosphoric acid on enamel. But you can get very high bond strengths to dentin without etching dentin. So you don't need to have phosphoric acid on dentin to get high bond strengths. So the idea of selective etch is you just etch enamel whether it's a cavo service margin or, or wherever there's some enamel present, you etch that and then you don't etch the dentin. So then you would use the, the uh, self-etching primers on the dentin and you'd use the etch and rinse technique where there's enamel. So three different etching modes. So when you're bonding to all or mostly all enamel, you'd probably wanna use a total etch technique because you're gonna get the highest bond strength to enamel with a total etch technique. If you're all or mostly all dentin, there's no need to put phosphoric acid on a tooth because you can get high bond strengths to dentin with a self etch technique. But if you have some enamel and some dentin, you're gonna to wanna to use a selective etch technique. So all of these etching techniques are, are gonna be used clinically depending on what the situation is. So I, this is important to understand because what type of adhesives are you gonna be using if you're using total etch, it's gonna be a fourth or fifth generation. If you're using self etch, it's gonna be a sixth generation or a seventh, but I'm gonna I'm gonna tell you in a minute why we don't recommend seventh generation anymore. And if you're gonna use selective etch, then you're gonna probably use self etching primers on that, okay? So just bear that in mind when we get to, to the types of adhesives we're gonna use and why, because clinically you're always gonna encounter all three of these situations. So the, what are the advantages of total etch? Higher bond strengths to cut and uncut enamel, as we said, better bond to sclerotic dentin, you're gonna have less risk of micro leakage at the cable surface margin for sure, because you're gonna get better sealing there. And they're more compatible with self-care and dual care composites and resin cements. The fourth generation three-step is probably the most compatible. The disadvantages in these are big. This is why self-etching primers I think were developed because strict protocols must be followed. Isolation and dry field are critical. Dent etch with phosphoric acid must not be over dried with the fourth and fifth generations, okay? This is important to understand because I'm gonna tell you a lot of these things with the newer adhesives you don't need to worry as much about as you did with fourth and fifth generation. And then open dentinal tubules may lead to post-op sensitivity. And we encountered that a lot because of strict protocols weren't followed. And because of post-op sensitivity, I think that was what led a lot to the, led to the development of self-etching primers. So the advantages of self-etch, well, they're easy to use. They're easier to use because you're eliminating one of the steps, which is the phosphoric acid gel. The variables associated with acid etch are eliminated. For example, when you etch a tooth, if you're etching dentin, your depth of etch is, it varies depending on how long you leave it on the tooth or how deep you're etching enamel, how long you leave the etch on the enamel. But if you're etching with a self-etching primer, you're etching and priming at the same time. So it's, it's self-limiting. You don't have variables associated like you do with, with the uh, etch and rinse technique. So that's why I said the, set, the depth of set etch, etch is self-limiting because you're etching and priming at the same time. And there's much less, you're much less likely to have post-op sensitivity. Uh, bond strengths to enamel are typically lower. High etch on dentin may decrease bond strength. So if you're using the selective etch technique and you inadvertently, and you're using a sixth generation self-etcher, which we'll talk about in a minute, and you inadvertently get etch onto the dentin, then you're gonna actually decrease bond strengths 
with a sixth generation. So that's something to think about too. You have to be very careful with the uh, self -ed I mean, selective edge technique that you kept the edge just on enamel when using a sixth generation. Bond strengths of self-cure and dual-cure composite cements are often poor with self-etching, okay? And that's because to be able to etch, they had to be more acidic, and the more acidic they are, the more incompatible you're going to see with dual-cure and self-cure resins and cements. And then long-term bonded dent may be susceptible to hydrolysis. It's, it's susceptible sixth generation because of the second step, and I'll, I'll explain that in just a minute, helps prevent that. But seventh generation adhesives did not have the ability to, they were, to prevent it. So they were very susceptible to hydrolysis because you didn't come back with a separate uh, adhesive layer after you etched and primed. So I'm going to explain that in just a minute. I know as I'm saying this may be a little confusing to you, but I'm going to explain. I just want to lay the groundwork here for you to understand. That's one of the big reasons why I don't think self etch uh, seventh generation single bottle self etchers we should use them anymore because they are so susceptible to hydrolysis and they're incompatible with a lot of resins in cements like self cures and dual cures. So therefore we have something that's much, much more available, that's available today, that's much more, more successful in these types of clinical situations called the universal adhesives. So that's kind of what I'm leading up to, the universal adhesives. So advantages of selective etch, high bond strengths to cut and uncut enamel because you're etching enamel, high bond strengths to sclerotic dentin because you can etch sclerotic dentin, high bond strengths to dentin without acid etching because you're gonna use the uh, self-etching primers on dentin, which you can get high bond strengths to it, and you're gonna have less technique sensitivity because you're not putting acid etch on dentin. And less, uh, so you're gonna have less risk of post-op sensitivity because you're not opening dentinal tubules. Remember, self-etching primers do not open dentinal tubules. They, they, they permeate the smear layer. They don't remove the smear layer like uh, phosphoric acid gel does. Disadvantages of self-etch, you just have to be careful. If you're using a six or seven generation, you can actually decrease bond strengths if the etch inadvertently gets onto dentin. So let's talk about the fourth generations, the total etch three steps. Total etch two steps is the fifth generation. So you had, you etched and rinsed step one, then you put your primer on step two, evaporate the solvent and come back with your adhesive layer step three. In the fifth generation, what manufacturers did, they just combined steps two and three where you prime and bond at the same time. So you have etch and rinse, then you put your, you prime and bond in a single coat, evaporate the solvent and like cure. Six generations, you have your etching and priming in step one, you evaporate the solvent and then you come back with a separate adhesive layer and a separate bottle. And that's why six generations were pretty successful and still are, especially when they're used with a selective etch technique where you're getting some acid etch just on enamel. So they worked well. The problem was when they combined both of these two steps like they did, it worked well with total etch technique when they combined steps two and three and it came with fifth generation. These Fifth generation still worked well. I used it for years, very successfully bonding in veneers with no bond, with no D bonds, no micro leakage, and, and you know, no post-op sensitivity. So you consider that clinically, in my mind, a success. But the problem that came in, the chemistries weren't, weren't ready yet. When they tried to combine the two steps, etching and priming with your adhesive layer into one bottle in the seventh generations you didn't have the proper chemistries yet and they, they didn't work successfully. And they were very susceptible to uh, bond degradation and hydrolysis over time. So I, my recommendation is if you are used or are using a seventh generation and you need to know, I would, I would recommend, highly recommend going to an eighth generation or what we call universal adhesives because they can be used with total etch, selective etch, or self etch. It doesn't matter which one of these you're using. You don't need any of these generations. You only need one, and it is a single bottle. Why? Because the chemistries that we have today allow us to do that. And just so you know, the first universal adhesive was developed by 3M uh, in the end of 2011. So they've been out for 10 years now. Okay, so we know that they've been out long enough to where if we were gonna see a lot of problems, they probably would have shown up by now. Scotch Bond Universal, that was the first one. And then All Bond Universal was right on its heels. 
Biscoe's Albon Universal came out right after Scott Bond Universal. So when I first started using Universal Adhesive, there were only two. And the reason I chose Albon Universal is that you didn't need a dual care activator. And I'd been using Albon 2 and Albon 3, and I liked them. So it was a natural transition. I like 3M's adhesives too. 3M's a great company with great adhesives. And their, their company was, their, their adhesive was good and still is. It's just that my choice was I didn't, I, I was familiar with Albon and I didn't need a dual care activator, but they're all good. So here's a little schematic here. So fourth generation, we talked about three steps. Fifth generation is two. They just took the primary adhesive and they combined it into one bottle. Sixth generation, you etched and prime step one, then your adhesive layer. And when used with a selective etch technique, it worked well. The problem is when the manufacturers combine the adhesive with the etch and prime into one bottle, the single bottle self etchers didn't work. So, and there, there were a lot of failures with this. And that's why I strongly recommend not using it. But with eighth generation or the universal adhesives, you can use total etch, selective etch, or self etch. So, in my mind, it's almost a no-brainer. You limit product inventory. You only need a single bottle. You don't worry about what uh, technique you're using or what clinical situation you encounter because it works both with total etch, selective etch, or self etch. And the other beauty of these universal adhesives, you don't have to worry about how wet you leave the dent. You don't want to desiccate the dent, but you don't really have to worry about drying. You don't have to leave the surface moist. In fact, they actually work a little bit better because water content you want to decrease, you don't want any excess water, okay? You, you, because it, it, the materials actually work better with less water. You just don't want to over dry the dent or desiccate the dent. Very simple and easy to use universal adhesives. I don't know how I could stress that anymore. They combine etching, priming, bonding in one bottle. They can be used with all three techniques. Here you see this would be self etch, this would be selective etch. I would not do a class two restoration without editing the cable service margin. You're just gonna get better bond to enamel. Even, I don't care what adhesive you use, I would use a selective etch technique. And this is an example of total etch technique. I don't think you need that here, but if I'm putting a porcelain veneer in or I'm bonding to almost all enamel, I'm definitely gonna use a total etch technique. It's just that it doesn't matter which of these three you're using, you could use it, you, they're all compatible with universal adhesives. That's the beauty of it. They can be used for direct and indirect restorations. They have a low film thickness, less than 10 microns. So it's critical. And I can't stress this enough either. Whatever one you use, and there's a lot of them, always read the manufacturer's instructions. They'll tell you. But one thing that's in the same all across the board is when you like cure, when you use universal adhesive and you like cure, I mean, excuse me, when you evaporate the solvent, you have to like cure before you place a restoration. The reason is, is that they're hydrophilic when they go on, but to become hydrophobic, they need to be light cured and to be hydrophilic. So they, they go on better and, they, and they're, they're water loving and there's a lot of water in Denton. So if you're bonding to Denton, you definitely want some hydrophilic, but for, for any cement or any uh, resin to bond to it, it needs to be hydrophobic. It becomes hydrophobic when you like cure it. So it's really critical that you like cure these, but also to understand that at less than 10 microns, it will not interfere with a seed or restoration. But if you are worried about that, there are dual cure options where you can, where you can use a universal adhesive with a dual cure capability. So it doesn't have to be like cured before you place the restoration. So low, low film thinks is a big one. Some need a dual cure activator, some don't. Again, read your manufacturer's instructions. Whichever one you use, it will tell you if you need a dual cure activator or not. Uh, they have some bond to glass and zirconia, but my preferences, and we'll get into this in just a minute, I still want to use dedicated primers. I don't use adhesive, uh, universal adhesives as a primer uh, like silane or zir zirconia primer. It can be used. There is some bond, which is good. That's an added benefit, but I don't use them as primers. So this is the uh, examples, what we have here. There's a lot more, there's new ones coming out every day. So just to give you an idea, how many manufacturers are, have come out with universal adhesives and they're, and they're still coming out. Um, you know, it's just hard to keep up with them because you know, every day it seems like a new one's coming out. But what this slide should tell you is, is that they wouldn't be investing the time to develop these materials if they didn't think they were good and they were successful. So I, if you're not using them, I encourage you to at least look into it, talk to your rep, talk to your manufacturers, talk to anybody 
get, you know, uh, you know, when you're at the dental meeting next time, go by their booths, talk to these people, and they'll be happy to share information with you. But I'm, I'm a big fan of universal adhesives because I think it simplifies your, your, uh, your workload. It makes life easier for you. There's nothing wrong. Dentistry is hard enough. We don't need it to be harder. It's, it, when everything goes right, it's hard. So anything that can help us in any way, make it simplify things, make it a little bit easier, make less steps, you know, that's good for us, especially when you're not compromising anything. If you can do something in less steps, seventh generation is a perfect example. They made it simpler. They made it easier. They made it less steps, but it was compromised results. You weren't getting the same results. Universal adhesives, it's simpler, easier, less steps, and you're not compromising any results. I've been using them for almost 10 years. I think clinically, because every single adhesive procedure I do, which is on a daily basis, every day, all day long, I think we would start to see some failures show up somewhere, some way, post-op sensitivity, uh, uh, micro leakage, debond, something like that, the restoration failure, and we're just not seeing that. So I, I, that's why I'm a, I'm a believer. Um, so we talked about ideal restorative material. What about an ideal bonding agent? We want ease of use. I think we, we beat that horse enough. We're talking about easy to use, fewer steps. That's what we were just talking about. Versatility. That's where universal adhesives are so versatile. It doesn't matter how you're etching. You want them compatible with self-cure, dual-cure, and light-cure resins and cements, which they are. You want high bond strengths to cut and uncut enamel and to dent and scrite. You can get that as long as you etch. You want a low film thickness so it doesn't interfere with the seat, which we have. You want no post-op sensitivity, which I don't see. No microleakage, which I don't see. And no, no debonds or failures. So restoration failures. So that's what we're looking for. And I think, in my mind, this pretty well covered in your... I'm not saying that a fifth, you know, fourth, fifth, or sixth generation won't do that too. It's just that it won't do it as versatile, as have much versatility as a universal adhesive would. All right, so we'll move on to cements now. Let's talk about cements. Um, and we're gonna div divide cements into two categories. I touched on this earlier at the beginning, conventional cementation, just to reiterate what I said, that means you don't do anything to the tooth other than, I mean, when I say don't do anything, I don't mean anything to increase bond strength to the tooth. If you wanna put an antimicrobial on a tooth, that's not increasing bond strength. If you wanna put a desensitizer on a tooth, that's not, increasing bond strengths. And I'm perfectly fine with that. In fact, I even recommend it. That's a good thing to do. And if you want to clean your restoration and use some type of cleaner, okay, you're not necessarily adhe adhering or, or making it, you know, increasing bond strengths. But if you're going to put some type of primer in a tooth, or you're going to treat a tooth by a glass or by etching, etching it, that is treating the tooth. So with vigil cementation, we don't do anything to the tooth or the restoration. We clean, we rinse our uh, restoration and dry and conventional adhesive resin cementation. Now we're going to have to use, it's in the name, we're going to have to use a resin cement because we're going to get the highest bond with a resin cement and we're going to have to treat the tooth and we're going to have to treat the restoration. And I'm going to go through how we do both of those, how we treat both the tooth and the restoration. And because I have a lot of clinical situations where I want to conventionally cement and because I have clinical situations where I didn't want to you know, bond something with an adhesive resin, we're going to need more than one type of cement. I think they're going to, you're going to need a couple of cements. I think you can definitely get by with one adhesive, a universal adhesive, but I think you're going to need a couple of cements and, I, and I'm going to go through that and tell you why. So do we cement or bond? What do we cement for? Efficiency, ease, easy cleanup. Uh, and with the newer cements, which we're going to talk about, regenerative ability or bioactivity. So that's just the beauty of some of these new materials and some of those that I talked about early on, some of the things like Doxa's products and, and some of these things where we see uh, ion release, you know, bioactivity, uh, tooth uh, restoration interface where it, where it interacts with, the, with the, the tissues there to form hydroxyapatite. I mean, these are some, some, some exciting things that we're, we're seeing in the future. And I think you're only going to see it more and more as, as we go along. What do we bond for? We bond for increased retention. We want to strengthen the material. Remember, why is a thin feldspathic veneer strong? Why do I have feldspathic veneers on my teeth that have been on for 25 years? The thinnest, weakest material because they're bonded to enamel. And when they are, they're strong. 
They're strong when they're bonded to tooth. So you actually strengthen material. That's why Emacs, when it's first developed, they said, well, it's 360, 400 megapascals. And they come back and now they're saying, well, you know, really and truthfully, if you bond Emacs, it's probably closer to five, 550 megapascals because it's stronger when you bond it. So you strengthen material. You can take someone like a, a weak uh, ceramic material and bond it to the tooth and actually make it stronger. And then we bond for aesthetics, okay? We, we, we not only, when we're doing an aesthetic restoration anteriorly, we're not bonding it just because we wanna increase the, the strength of the material and the retention of the material. We're also, because we're using very translucent materials, we need a cement that's aesthetic. We need a cement that has, you know, maybe is translucent or, or isn't gonna affect the color of our restoration. So this is why we cement and why we bond. And we're gonna go through this and talk about it. So the cements, and I'll do this like I did the materials, you know, and zinc phosphate cements, do they work? Sure they work. I have patients in my practice, I'm 70 years old. I've been practicing for 40 years in my office, 41 years right now in the office I'm in now. So I've seen patients for a long time and I have patients that have had crowns in their mouth for those 40 years that were done before I even became their dentist. And they were probably put on with zinc phosphate cement. So will it work? Yeah, it works. Would I want to use it? No way. Do I want to mix on a glass slab and get it to the perfect consistency Then hurry up and get it in the crown and get it on the crown and then have to listen to the patient for two days afterwards because their tooth is sensitive? That's what's going to happen. Will they work? Absolutely, they'll work. There's other problems with it. Polycarboxylate cements, nice thing about that is they're easy to use There's they're, and they won't cause the post-op sensitivity, but still there you, you have... You, your, your marginal integrity is at risk because they're not as strong and they're more, more likely to wash out. Same thing with glass glassomerous, even though they release fluoride, they just don't have strong physical properties, but they're great. They, they have, because they release, release fluoride, they're, it's not a bad cement, but you can take this good cement glass glassomer, you combine it with resin called resin modified glass glassomer, you can make it, you give it better physical properties, you still have some moisture tolerance, maybe not the true moisture tolerance you have with a true glass iron or cement, but some moisture tolerance. They're simple and easy to use. You mix it. Now you don't even have to mix cements anymore. That's the other reason. I mean, zinc phosphate used to be a pain to do that. And you had that exothermic reaction. So you had to keep it cool while you're mixing it. That's why you had to keep a glass slab in your refrigerator and you can only mix the cement on a cool surface. Now we have a, your assistant picks up a gun, just make sure she puts a new tip on it and squeezes a handle and puts the cement right into the crown. It couldn't be easier. And we can do it not only with all of our new cements now, right into the restoration. Resin modified glass automers. I mentioned that the that, that Fujisim Evolve at the beginning here, this is their newer one. This is an improved, Fujisim 2 was an improvement over Fujisim. Then they improved to Fujisim 2, and now it's come out even better, newer and better. It's Fujisim Evolve, you know. And so these are the lot. I have a lot of colleagues that are big fans of, of resin modified glass armors, and 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 rightfully so. It's simple and easy to use. They they have retentive properties of the restoration and the tooth. You're going to get some uh, self adhesion to the tooth, and and you know they they're easy, simple to use, and easy to clean up. Uh, the next category of I say conventional cementation are what we call the self-adhesive resin cements. And so this, these are not, you know, resin modified. These are just true resin cements, just like we would do uh, our resin cement to bond a crown on. The difference is, is these resin cements you can use without treating the tooth of the restoration. You just put the cement in the crown, put the crown on the tooth. You don't have to do anything to the crown. You don't have to do anything to the restoration. The cements themselves incorporate so certain self etching primers that, that get you some bond to tooth. So there'll be some adhesion to the restoration and some bond to tooth. They're low bond strengths, nothing like what you get when you treat the tooth of the restoration, but you get some bond to tooth. They're fast, they're simple, and they're easy to use. Uh, and again, these are this is a category that I meant when I mentioned GCM1, uh, GCM1 at the beginning. Uh, it also is uses their. Uh, adhesive enhancing primer, which can actually give you, if you use this primer on the tooth, it actually gives you a little bit better retention than you get with just using the cement. So this is a category I like for its simplicity, for the strength of the material, for the fact that they're, they're uh, you know, you don't, you don't see a lot of washout with resins. They're, they're, they're pretty much impervious to, uh, to uh, saliva and to, to, to moisture breakdown. Uh, 
but there's a newer category that not only offers the benefits of the resin cements, but it also offers the benefits of ion release. And these are the bioactive or the ion releasing and recharging. Some of them like Ceramic Crown and Bridge have no resin component. And some of them like Activa's uh, bioactive cement and Therosim have a resin component. So they're truly a self-adhesive resin cement with an ion release more than just fluoride. It has fluoride and calcium and pulp dense uh, bioactive cement actually releases fluoride, calcium and phosphate ions. So you got fluoride with Ceramic Crown and Bridge you're gonna have fluoride and calcium release with their sim, you're gonna have fluoride and calcium release. Now calcium release is a big deal. Calcium is gonna help form hydroxyapatite, but it also elevates the pH. So you're gonna have an alkaline, a more basic pH, again, which you get some really nice uh, benefits from this, uh, acid neutralization, uh, bacteria static. Uh, so, you're, you know, so it's gonna uh, resist uh, recurrent decay, bacteria influx, things like this. So we're looking at some cements that not only just hold the restoration on, that are not just simple and easy to use, but almost could, but also can greatly benefit us in other ways, like you know, releasing ions that can be extremely beneficial uh, to the tooth and to the uh, longevity of the restoration. So as far as he's a resin cements, they can be divided into two categories: dual cure and light cure. Dual cure is because when you have a a resin cement and it has to be so let me back up for one second just so i'm, I'm clear i don't want to be too confusing here when we're talking about self-adhesive resin cements and in this category uh both the relax uni sim 2 and the g sim 1 this is a self-adhesive resin cement it is a dual cure okay meaning it will cure in the dark but it also will cure with light so if light can't get to it it will cure. You can put this restoration on the tooth and it will cure. Same thing with this Activa Bioactive and the Therosim. These are resin cements that are dual cure. They have both a light cure and a self cure capability. Okay, I wanna be clear on that because when we get into the light cure and dual cure cements, same thing that you see with the self adhesive resin cements, you're gonna have the dual cure cements. This is for a for clinical situations where the light can't penetrate the restoration to completely polymerize the resin. So that, those are the cases, the situ, clinical situations where we, you would need a dual cure cement. And a, if you have a very thin veneer, for example, and you have the ability for the light to penetrate and polymerize the resin completely, then you don't need dual cure capability. You can have a true light cure cement. Now, the benefit of that used to be twofold. Now, without getting too technical, without boring you to death, dual cure cements had chemistries in them to make them self cure. Okay. So they'll self polymerize. And one of them is what they called tertiary amines. Now, tertiary amines would help with the self cure process, but they also would darken over time. So nobody would want to use a dual cure cement and an anterior very thin restoration because it could darken and affect the color of a very thin translucent veneer. Most of the modern newer cements we're using have a new technology where they're not using amines, these uh, tertiary amines. So that's not really something you need to worry about anymore, but here's the deal. If you're putting multiple restorations in, for me, the reason I love light cure cements for veneers, if I'm putting four, six, eight or more veneers in, and I want to put them in simultaneously, I need more working time, which I don't have with dual cure cements. So if I'm putting multiple rest restorations in with a dual cure cement, I can only put in a couple at a time because of your limited working time, because the self, once you mix them and once they're, they're mixed uh, and you squeeze in the gun and the cement mixes, the, the self cure process starts. With a light cure, it will not cure until the light shines on it. If you turn your opportunity light off, you can have really much longer working time. So that's why I like light cure cements, not only for the color, for the strength, and for the ability to do multiple restorations, and they won't cure, I have excess working, more working time because it won't cure until the light polymerizes. So what I'm leading up to is, I think you need in your armamentarium both a light cure and a dual cure as a spin. I think you're gonna have clinical situations where you need one of each. And I think you're also gonna have clinical situations where you might wanna use something that's simpler and easier to use. 
It could be a resin modified glass onomer. It could be a self adhesive resin cement, or it could be one of the newer uh, uh, cements like Ceramer or Therosim or uh, the Activa Biactive cement that releases ions. I, I'm not sure you could pick. I don't think you need one of all three of those categories. I really don't. I think it's more product inventory than you need to keep because they all work and they all work well. And it's just your choice right now. I think someday, and I could be wrong and don't quote me on this, but I think someday we're going to be cementing with what we call the new bioactive materials. I just think they're, they're just too promising. They just look too good. I think research that we've seen and some of the work of Stephen Jeffries and some of these people that you're, they're showing gap closure uh, in, in experiments that they're running. I just think that we're, that, you know, in, in the, the, the basic pH, uh, the, the alkaline pH is the, the benefits of that. I just, I just think that we're heading in a direction that we're gonna see this more and more, but for now, until it becomes even more conclusive, any of those cement categories, I just, I'm just trying to simplify this for you. I still think you need a simple conventional cement, but I think you need a light cure to dual cure resin cement. So that's kind of my, my deal on that. So one adhesive, I think you're good, but I think you need probably three cements for simplicity stake. So the dual cure resin cements, uh, Bisco's got a great one, deal, uh, the dual link. Uh, GC has a really good one, the GCM link force, but there's a lot in this category. Ken Ball is an interesting in this category, the dual cure resin cements. The reason the Vesalis Simcore is called Simcore is because it's not only a dual cure resin cement, it can also be used as a core buildup material. So actually it's kind of like two products in one. So it's a kind of a neat, it's a neat product. You can use it as a cement and it has uh, uh, dedicated primers if you need extra adhesion, both for the tooth and for the restoration. So it's a, it, you can, it's, you're gonna get high bond strengths if you use it as a cement, but you can also use it as a core buildup material, which I think is, is kind of neat. Gives you, a, gives you a kind of a, a little versatility there. As far as light cure cements go, uh, GC just came out, this is brand new. Up until very recently, they didn't have a veneer cement. And they would, and I would tell them, I said, you know, your cements are great. You need a veneer cement. Well, I don't think they listened to me, but they do have a veneer cement called GC Veneer. And we're, we're actually uh, evaluating this product right now. We just, I don't even know if it's on the market yet, uh, but what I've used it a couple of times and I really like it. It's a really good light cure cement, uh, Visco's Choice 2. Accolade PV, Zestus. I like Accolade. It's got a clear cement that's really clear. Pulp dense, clear veneer. If you're looking for, it's aptly named. If you're looking for a really translucent cement, clear veneer, kind of catchy name too. Very translucent. Accolade has a very translucent shade too. Uh, and then there's some companies that said, you know, they agree. I guess they agree with me. They know there's times you're going to need a light cure. They know there's times you're going to need a dual cure. So they'll say, well, we'll just put it in one kit. Ivoclar's got uh, very like acetic LC and DC. Uh, Bisco's got the e-cement kit. It's got a single barrel and a dual barrel for a light cure and a dual cure. And Kerr's got the Nexus third generation. And it's got a single barrel for light cure only. It's got a dual barrel for dual cure. They come in a kit. Or you can buy them individually if you like to mix and match because these are all great products. And let me tell you, as many as I mentioned tonight, there's that many more good ones. So if you're there using, well, he hasn't mentioned one product I use, that doesn't mean that yours isn't just as good because they probably are. I evaluate products. I like products. I work with certain companies uh, and, and I like their products. And I, I shared this tonight is not about anything other than sharing information. It's not like, I'm smarter. I'm not smarter than anybody. I don't know more than anybody else. I've learned from some smart people. My biggest advantage is, is that I've been fortunate to have some great mentors and learn from some really good people. And, and these people shared information with me. Um, being involved in Catapult has been great because um, being involved in Catapult was great simply because they um, have so many of my colleagues there that, that when we're together, you know, we're kind of bouncing ideas and sharing ideas and sharing information. So a lot of stuff I, 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 I've I learned, I talk about, I've learned from other people. And there's so many great products out there uh, that's just impossible to name them all. So uh, I'm trying to give you an idea what some good ones are in category. So if you're using something in that category, it's probably just as good as anything I've mentioned tonight. So what do we like about 
our cements. What are we looking for? We want something easy to mix. We want a low film thickness. We want low viscosity. When we're evaluating these, these are some of the characteristics they're asking us to evaluate. They want us to say, how is it, how is it easy to mix? What's about viscosity is important because it makes it easier to see a restoration if it has a lower viscosity. Do you have enough working time without it being too long? I want to be able, to, I want to short my working time. So I'm going to tell you a little technique that I use on these cements when I'm using conventional cementation that shortens my working time by doing what I call, I, I just named it a flash cure. I'm curing this cement, the excess cement under pressure, either a finger or cotton roll, and I cure it for like two seconds. I'll go like 1001, 1002, boom, that's all the lights on there. And what it does, it sets the cement into a gel state and it allows it to clean it off real easy. <clears throat> Short setting time, insoluble in oral fluids. That's, what, that's one of the benefits of resin cements. They're very insoluble in oral fluids, which is important. High shear, tensile, and compressive strengths. Uh, we want ability, and this is where, again, resin cements have a little bit of an advantage here because they, they score high in all these areas. Able to buff. And that would make sense because if we want our, our highest retention, our most strength and our highest retention, what are we gonna use? A light cure, a dual cure resin cement. So that would make sense. Able to bond, and sometimes we don't need it. If we got a great retentive prep, if you've got you know, four millimeters of axial wall height and six to eight degrees of taper, you've got a retentive prep. And you could put that, you've got a well-fitting restoration. You can use any kind of cement and it's gonna work well. You don't need extra strength, but if you're putting a porcelain veneer in, now you need these things, you know, or, or a non-retentive situation, then these come in, become a bigger factor. You want ability to bond to two structure, you want it bi biocompatible with pulp and soft tissue, you want a translucency in some areas like I've talked about, you want it to be, you, you don't always need translucency, but sometimes you do. Radio opacity is a big thing. Radio, we, the materials, our composites and cements are getting more radio opaque. Manufacturers have finally figured out that it keeps us from misdiagnosing things. Uh, you could put, I've seen restorations come in, um, patients come in and look at a restoration and I'm going, is that a liner? Is that a composite liner under that class two composite or is that decay? So radio opacity will help us in diagnosing situations and making sure that we don't have recurrent decay and easy to clean up. And we'll talk about easy to clean up as we finish up. So all right, in the last 10 minutes here, before we wrap it up and ask questions, I'm gonna just go through some real quickly, some clinical application. So we talked about materials, we've talked about adhesives and we talked about cements. Now let's tie it all together in some clinical situations and talk about depending on what kind of material we're doing, what kind of adhesive we're using and what kind of cement, how we tile that together to put it on both, it, both adhesively and conventionally cement. So we're gonna look at adhesive cementation of a glass ceramic veneers. They, they could be feldspathic, they could be, well, not loose side anymore because Empress is gone. Feldspathic lithium silicate, which are glass ceramics. We're gonna use a total etch technique because we're gonna be bonded to a lot of enamel and we're gonna use a light cure resin cement because these are thin restorations and we don't, we can cure through the restoration. Then we'll look at adhesive cementation of lithium silicate. We're using a dual cure. We're going to use a self etch technique. Here we're using total etch technique. Here we're going to use a self etch technique. Here we're using a light cure cement. Here we're going to use a dual cure resin. Both of them are going to be glass. And then lastly, we're going to look at bonding in a zirconia crown with a self etch technique and a dual cure resin cement. So those are the three techniques. And we'll go through this kind of quickly. So glass ceramic veneer, step one, whenever you're bonding, adhesively bonding, you have to control bleeding. That's one of the another reasons why cementation, you still, you don't want any bleeding, but it's critical if you're adhesively bonding, especially anterior restorations, because any blood, any curricular fluid could lead to some micro leakage and it could ruin your day if you get it, because it's going to make, probably require you redo that restoration. So controlling bleeding is really important. Step one, whenever we adhesively bond, I always have isolate with a rubber dam. I, that's my recommendation. I'm not telling you what to do or how to do it. I'm just telling you that if I'm going to adhesively bond, that's another reason why I love self etching primers. It's another reason why I love conventional cementation. I don't have to put a rubber dam on. And there's cases where I don't need a rubber dam. But if I'm bonding in veneers, or if I'm bonding in a, a, an on lay or an inlay or something like that, and I'm going to be using a total etch technique or a selective etch technique, I want isolation and I want a dry field. So I'm going to use a rubber dam. We're going to rinse or place our gel and rinse. 
apply our bonding agent. In my case, it's a universal adhesive, perhaps the solvent and light cure. Always have to light cure 10, 10 microns. It will not interfere with the seed of the restoration. Place resin cement. When I'm doing veneers, I place the cement on the teeth. I learned this many, many years ago and I never changed. Every time I put the cement in the veneer, like you do a crown and I go to put it on there, it sticks to my glove. It's hard, it's hard to put it on the tooth. It's so much easier to place a, a thin little veneer if the cement is on the tooth and the cement will stay right there on the tooth. Clean the excess cement with gauze, cotton rolls or brushes, tack restorations at the gingival margins, floss interproximal contacts, light cure. I'm going through this kind of fast because I'm gonna show you in slides. Re remove the light cured cement with a, with a scaler, uh, polish interproximal contacts with finishing strips, Take the rubber dam off, adjust occlusion where necessary, and polish. That's how we do it. So first off, how do we prepare the restorations? Well, in glass ceramics, now I wanted, there's a difference in how you clean glass versus how you clean zirconia. With glass, you can clean with almost anything. I've always cleaned glass with phosphoric acid because it removes any kind of uh, any contamination, and it kind of acidifies the surface, which makes your silane coupler work even better. You can also clean glass with Avaclar's Avaclean or Bisco's Zirclean, which are, which are primarily developed to clean zirconia, which is a must when you're cleaning zirconia. You have to use a zirconia cleaner for zirconia. You don't for glass, however you want to do it. We rinse, we dry, we apply our silane. Restorations, if you're in your office milling a glass, you're going to need to etch it with hydrofluoric acid. And you should know that if you're doing it in your office. If you're getting it from the laboratory, it's going to come back from the laboratory etched but after a try and we always place silane on the frosty surface. Allow the silane to sit for a minute and dry, place it aside by tooth number. So here's our rubber dam. We put two holes when I'm doing veneers. In this case, we're putting in 10 veneers, numbers four through 13, about an inch apart, about an inch down from the top of the dam. I put the dam on the frame so I can, I can orient where I want the holes to go better. I take scissors and I cut a straight line, straight line between the holes. I use wingless clamps on the first molar. I clamp the first molar, then I walk this hole around the back of the clamp, this hole around the back of the clamp, and this little piece right here folds up underneath the lip and it looks just like that. Now I've got a dry field, I've got isolation, I can put some cotton gauze in the pallet to seal that off, but I've got my hands free working and I've got the rubber dam isolate everything and the lip up and out of the way. So here we have our case, we've got our tin veneers. I can, you can use some kind of disinfectant, which I like to do, like consepsis, I also use Bisco's uh, Select HV Edge. It has an antimicrobial uh, in it um, of benzoclonium chloride. So it just depends on what, what it you want. But we etch five teeth and rinse, and we etch five teeth and rinse. I don't want etch on teeth if there's any, if there's just enamel and no dentin, you could leave it on there for 30 seconds. It probably wouldn't matter. But if there's dentin, I don't want it on dentin for more than 15 seconds. So we try to have the etch rinsed off within 15 seconds. So we're going to, um, we're going to rinse this. The other thing I like about this, you notice the name Select HV Etch. Select is for the selective etch technique. It's very viscous. So it stays where you put it. And it was developed for that selective etch technique when you want it to be just on the enamel margin and not running over or spilling over or onto the dentin. Okay, so it stays right where you put it. That's why I like it for doing veneers too. It keeps it off the gum tissue. So then we're going to rinse, leave dry. I mean, now with universal adhesives, I don't worry about leaving the teeth as moist. I don't over dry them, but I don't see any moisture. This is our Bisco Albon Universal right here. We'll put multiple coats on, we paint them on, we're evaporating the solvent, and then we light cure it. Then we put our, we have our veneers separated by tooth number. We're, this is choice two, and we'll go ahead and put that, or you can use the, uh, Bisco also has the uh, light cure cement and the single, we're using a light cure only cement right here. We're gonna put it on the tooth. You can see it's placing it on the tooth. And then we can seed all the restorations at one time. Because the operatory lights off, I have unlimited working time. It's another advantage of having a light cure cement. I wipe away all the excess. We, we tack the margins. We tack at the gingival margin so I can floss the contacts after we've cleaned them up. If you can't get through with the floss, don't force the floss. Take one of these little serrated uh, blades and just go slightly down and lightly back. Then you can floss your contacts. Then we light cure everything. If there's a little excess of gingival margin, I use a scaler. And then we adjust the occlusion. I mean, I'm finishing the lingual margins. We polish it approximately, check the occlusion and polish. 
I'm going to skip through this. This is just a case where we put 10 veneers in in front of an audience. It was kind of fun, but you just saw what we did. In the interest of time, I'm going to go on through that. So now let's look at a posterior glass crown. So this is this is a little different now and because we're going to use a dual cure cement and a self-etch technique, and I don't need a rubber dam. Everything else stays the same. It's exactly the same protocol, except I'm not isolating with a rubber dam. And our, if you're milling in your office, etch lithium to silicate for 20 seconds with hydrofluoric acid, rinse and dry. If it's coming from the laboratory, it's already etched. Clean it with a cleaner or with phosphoric acid, just like the veneers, rinse, dry, apply silane, allow it to sit for a minute. Then you can go ahead, my assistant can go ahead and put the cement right in the crown. So these are two lithium to silicate crowns, posterior crowns. You know they're lithium silicate because you see the frosty appearance. So they're, after try-in, we rinse, we clean them, rinse and dry. They're going to look like that. Here we have our, um, our pre-hydrolyzed pre silane. It's a single bottle. You can have it pre-hydrolyzed and, and non-hydrolyzed where you have to mix them together. If you use it up pretty fast, you can use pre-hydrolyzed. If you don't use silane a lot, you can get separate bottles and mix it right before you use it. It'll be stronger and more effective. So we're going to go ahead and silenate our surface, let it sit for a minute. And then while my assistant's doing that, I've isolated with a cotton roll. I rinse, I dry, and I've taken my universal adhesive, my all bond universal, I'm just painting it on as a self etch technique onto the preparations. I evaporate the solvent. Now, if you think your preparations are retentive and you've got zirconia crown, you just submit them. I don't do any of this. But if you had a non retentive situation and you were trying to bond it, this is how you would do it, a non-retentive situation. If it's retentive, you don't need these steps. So I light cure, evaporate the solvent. My assistant is filling up the crown with a dual cure cement after she's uh, silenated and, and dried it. We put it on, you can see the excess cement. I put my light up there, I go 1001, 1002, and then it's in this gel state and it just peels right off, both facially and legal. I floss the contacts, I have them bite on a cotton roll for about two or three minutes to let the self-cure chemistry take effect. And then we'll come back and light cure 20 seconds, facial lingual and occlusal. But I, after I clean the excess off, I wanna let the self-cure uh, chemistry take effect before I come back with my light cure to increase the strength. And then lastly, with zirconia, our steps for bonding zirconia is a little bit different. I call it the DAPC, okay? So the D is for decontaminate, all right? So you've got to decontaminate zirconia. Zirconia, when it's tried in the mouth, zirconia is going to get contaminated from phospholipids in saliva, okay? And you need to decontaminate, decontaminate if you want the highest bond strengths. And we do that with our zirclean or our ivoclean. Then where the A is air particle abrasion, you're gonna, studies have shown you can increase bond to zirconia if you use air particle abrasion. Uh, you want to use a uh, uh, 50 micron uh, aluminum oxide at, at uh, you know, not at full force. You want it a, a low force. You don't want to really blast it. You're really using it as a cleaner uh, to make sure the surface is clean. And uh, it also allows your primer to bond better to zirconia. Then the P is for primer. In this case, it'll be our zirconia primer, like Z prime plus, I uh, Ivoclar's got uh, Monobond Plus, you know, something like that. And then the C is for your composite resin goes in. So that's how we prepare the crown. I'm doing the teeth the exact same way. So that you, you're going to put your uh, your Zirclean in by or your Ivoclean in for 30 seconds and dry air particle abrasion with aluminum oxide and your uh, Zirconia Primer, Z Prime Plus or Monobond Plus. Crown, a bite on the cotton roll, flash cure for two to three seconds, remove gel. This is kind of redundant. I understand that, but this is the same steps we go through. Allow cement to complete self-cure. Then we light cure, adjust occlusion, and polish. So these are our zirconia crowns. Notice the surface. It's not frosty, okay? We could probably cement these in. The preps look pretty retentive, but let's say you wanted to bond them. So this is our cleaner. We clean the surface. Well, this is Ivoclean right here. And we rinse that, we put it in there for 30 seconds, rinse and dry. Then you come back, this is a Z prime plus right here. My assistant does this. She puts the cleaner in, she rinses it. She does the uh, air particle abrasion. She does that too. She cleans it, does the air, air particle abrasion right there chair side. 
uh, with a little micro etcher or uh, you know whatever you're using for your air particle abrasion. Then after she dries it, she puts her Z prime plus and lets that sit for a minute. She dries that. Then she takes her dual cure cement. Whatever you're using is your dual cure cement. She places that. See the dual barrel syringe. It's mixing as it's going down the tip. So the cement is in the crown. She hands me the crowns. I place while she's doing all of this. This is what makes it so easy. I don't need to isolate with a rubber dam. Again, I put a cot roll in there. I'm using my universal adhesive. I paint multiple coats. I light cure. I mean, I, I dry this, lightly air dry it. Then I light cure it. I'm doing that while she's getting the crowns ready. It's almost simultaneously. By the time she's got the crowns ready, I've got the teeth light cured ready. She hands me the crowns. I put them on the teeth. I have them, I, I hold finger pressure or have them bite on a cotton roll. Now, if you prefer, you can have them bite on a cotton roll and wait two minutes, about two minutes, and it'll self-cure to a gel state. What you don't want to do is wait too long. If you go away or you forget and it sets up rock hard, these are hard to clean off and it's going to be hard to floss. But in the gel state, it peels. See how easy it peels off right there? And it flosses really easy. Then we let it self-cure for three to four minutes, and then we light cure just occlusion and polish. And there's your final restorations. So I get asked a lot, what, what do you use in what clinical situation? So conventional cementation of lithium silicate, zirconia, layered zirconia, or metal ceramics, conventional cementation. That means I have a retentive prep. You can use resin modified glass onomer, you can use self-adhesive resin cements, or you can use a bioactive ion releasing cement. I'm fine with any of those categories. This is where I said, you don't need one of each. You just need to pick one out of this category and they're all good and you can't go wrong because they all work clinically. Some have benefits, others don't have, but that's, that's a personal choice. However, in a non-retentive situation, what would I use? I would bond with a universal adhesive and a dual cure cement. So with that, I thank you for your attendance. I'm, I went a minute or two over, but I'm opening it up. It looks like we do. Uh, have a couple of questions. And to wrap this up, I'm going to go ahead and, and uh, address address the questions. Uh, one of it is, what magnification loops do you use, please? Okay, so I have um, Zenith, uh, not Zenith, uh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm, my, I, you know, at my age, sometimes my brain just doesn't work. But anyway, I've had loops for years. I could not work without loops. I can't stress strongly enough loops. My power is 3.5. I have the longer ones. They have the extended field of vision. I probably, now that I've gotten older, I probably benefit going to 4.5. I still feel like I see pretty good with 3.5, but I designs for vision. I'm sorry. I don't, I don't even know where Zenith came from. Anyway, designs for vision, but there's a lot of great manufacturers out there. And uh, again, I don't, I recommend go to a dental meeting, go to a, some booths, try them out, talk to the people, talk to the reps, get some good advice and, and experiment and look at them before you do. But if you're not using magnification, I, I think you're missing something. I, I mean, it just, I honestly, I, I can't, I'm to the point now, I can't do a hygiene check without having to have my loops on. I can't see, I literally can't see anything in the mouth. I can't even see what a tooth looks like anymore. So I love my loops. Great, great question. Uh, food staining. The question, I have a question that says any food staining. I'm sorry, any food staining question mark. I don't understand the question, but uh, food staining, uh, I'm sorry. I, somebody can maybe help me there. Not sure I understand that question. Uh, when cementing veneers, Food staining could be a lot of different things. Most of most restorations don't stain. Porcelain restorations do not stain. Food or beverage. We do porcelain veneers. We tell them you can drink tea, wine, coffee. It doesn't matter. Porcelain veneers are very color stable and don't stain. Composite is not as color stable. Over time, you will start to see more staining in composite than you will with porcelain. When cementing veneers all at the same time, how can you make sure they don't move out of place? Great question, okay? So here's the thing. I used to try veneers in. We try them all in and they all sit there nice, okay? Then I put them in two at a time or, you know, and then I get to the back and they don't fit anymore because they get, I don't know what happens, but when I get to the back, the occlusion was tight where it wasn't before. I mean, the contacts were tight where it wasn't before. 
So what I found out is when I try them all in at 10 and they fit, when I put them in with a the cement, they don't move because the cement is holding them to the tooth. But the way we keep them from moving when we floss them is we tack them. We take a, a, a light with a three millimeter tacking tip. I hold the veneer and then right at the gingival margin, I showed that in a slide. Unfortunately, I'm sorry, I probably went kind of fast, but I showed that in a slide where we tack it at the gingival margin and that holds it. Then I can floss the contacts and they don't move. But when I put them all in at the same time, I know they're all gonna seat because I tried them in all at the same time. So. I guess that's it. I don't have any other questions coming in. Um, Lisa, you don't have any other questions, do you? I guess you're there. Uh, no, I think that's it. Okay, I guess we're good. All right, well, I wanna thank everybody for, for joining us tonight. Uh, like I said, uh, my, my goal was to just share some information. Hopefully there's been some useful information for you and um, I'm happy to answer questions. If you have something, uh, a question that you didn't get a chance to ask or didn't get answered properly, um, go to my website and send me a question. Thank you so much. Everybody have a great evening. Thank you all.